In the 10th chapter of Mark, a rich young man comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. And he eventually tells him to go and sell all that he has and give it to the poor and to take up a cross and follow Jesus. Now, when Bible students read that, they usually focus on those two parts. Number one, they focus on the fact that Jesus told him to sell all that he had and give it to the poor. And they wonder if that's something that everyone is supposed to do. But of course, that is not the case because that's the only man that he ever told to sell all that he had and give it to the poor. The attitude, though, there is a lesson to be learned about putting Christ first and being willing to lay aside everything in order to follow him, to put aside our will and our way and to always focus on Jesus and doing what he wants us to do. And our marching orders would be something like Galatians 6 and verse 10, as we have opportunity let us do good to everyone, especially to those of the household of faith. We are to help people. We are to help those in need. But there was something else going on there with that young man as far as what his attitude was and what was going on in his mind and in his heart. And Jesus could see that. Now, the other part that gives people trouble, and this one probably gets more attention than the first one, and that is when Jesus told him, why do you call me good? He says, good teacher, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is no one good except God. And some people think that he was denying his deity there. He was saying that he was not God. But that would contradict the other parts of the Bible. And that would contradict uh, the fact that he is good. Jesus would never say that he wasn't good. He was the Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God that came into the world. So there has to be another explanation. And I believe this is it. Do you understand, young man, what you are saying? There is no one good but God, and by calling me good, you are affirming that I am God, and you need to listen to what I'm going to tell you, and you need to do what I say. That is a reasonable explanation, and that one harmonizes with all that the Bible says about Jesus being the Son of God. So don't be confused by the story of the rich young man. It is a powerful story, and we may not understand all of it, but we certainly get the point. And it's a powerful point that we don't need to forget. All right, so welcome to the podcast we call the assembly and we're glad to have you with us and we'll start off i guess by hitting a couple of questions and uh, that our viewers have sent in and um, see where we go from there all right so the first question that we've got is is loving money a sin loving money a sin uh yeah i would say yeah um, in fact, that goes back to what we were just talking about, about the rich young man. He loved his possessions more than he loved God, and he did not want to part with them because of the tie that he had to those things, the love that he had for those things. Uh, Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many a life has been ruined by the love of money. Now, he doesn't say money is the root of all evil, but he says a love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, is what he's saying. So, yes, you're on dangerous ground when you love money. Now, appreciating what you have and working hard to have more and better things, uh, liking money, if you will, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with, with any of that if you're willing to share. And because he tells those who are rich in the present age, just a few verses later, to do good and to share and to be rich in good works. He doesn't tell them that uh, they are to give all of their money to the poor, uh, like Jesus told the rich young man. And uh, he even said that it is God who gives us richly all things to enjoy there in First Timothy chapter 6. So... Uh, yes, loving money is a problem, a big problem. you got to keep your priorities straight when it comes to that. It's an easy trap to fall into. All right, let's do one more. All right, this viewer asked if you have a specific Bible translation that you would recommend or if all are good. Um, I would definitely recommend the NIV, the New International Version. Uh, that's the one I read from now more than any. I have traditionally read from the New King James more than any other, but uh, now I probably read from the NIV more than that. And the New Living Translation is an excellent translation. It's very up-to-date and very modern. We've done several videos on this subject, and I think the thing that I've always tried to impress upon you is to find the Bible that you enjoy reading. Any standard translation, not a one-man paraphrase necessarily, although some of them are good. 
you should never use a one-man paraphrase or a, or a paraphrase of any kind uh, as your main Bible, in my opinion. But any of the standard translations, the New King James, the New American Standard, the, uh, the NIV, the ESV, the New Century Version, the New Living Translation, and even the King James Version, if a lot of people still like that one. But you're not going to read something you don't understand. So my advice would be to check out the NIV and uh, the New Living Translation and see if you like the way that one of those reads, because they're both very accurate and they're both easily understood. And that's the point of reading the Bible is to understand it so that we can know more about Christ. So that's what I would recommend. And you need to be a free person in Jesus and know that you have every right to pick the translation that you enjoy reading. Because all of the standard translations are going to teach you about the Word of God and are going to teach you the truth about Jesus Christ. And uh, they're not going to lead you astray. All right. What does it mean to trust in Jesus. You know, the Bible teaches that in order to be saved, we must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are to trust him for everything in life. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to trust him? I want to give you some things today that will help you understand why we trust in Jesus and what trusting in him means, especially when it comes to uh, salvation. And these are things you can not only apply to your own life if you have never received Jesus, but for those of you who have, and probably most people watching this already have, then you can share these things with others. And the first thing I want you to think about is the fact that God demands perfection. So you could call that God's perfect demands. God is perfect. And what he demands from everyone is perfection. And the reason that we have not lived up to what God has told us to do and what God has given us to do is because we have not been absolutely perfect. In 1 John 1 and verse 5, the Bible says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Holiness, the holiness of God, the perfection of God, the goodness of God, sin, any sin infringes on that holiness or insults that holiness. And somebody's got to pay the price for that. Now, do I understand how God is perfect? And do I understand how he requires perfection? No, I don't understand all that because I am a sinner. But I know what the Bible teaches. Now, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, it says the law could make nothing perfect. Therefore, it was not good enough. The law of Moses could not make people perfect. And uh, he says in verse 4, it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. We could not be made perfect. We could not be made holy. We could not be made righteous by uh, animal blood or animal sacrifices. And so these were just put into place to teach us. They were a shadow, he says, of the things that were coming. They were a type of what was coming. And what was coming was Jesus Christ. So you got God's perfect demands. You know, take your shoes off, Moses. You're standing on holy ground. That's the attitude of the Bible. That's the teaching of the Bible in both Testaments, that God dwells in unapproachable light, and he is absolutely perfect in every way. And the only thing that can please him is perfection. That's the bad news. And before you hear the gospel, which means good news, you got to understand the bad news, that we are sinners who have broken God's covenant. And doesn't matter what you think about it or what I think about it. doesn't matter what our opinions are. All that matters is what God has said. So God's perfect demands, you need to understand that, that you can only trust in something outside of yourself because you've never been obedient to God. You've never been righteous. You've never been perfect. You've never been holy in the absolute sense. So that brings up God's perfect doing, D-O-I-N-G, doing. That means that Jesus came into the world to do something for us that we could never do for ourselves. And that is to live a perfect life in a human body. He deals with that as well, beginning in verse 5 and following in Hebrews chapter 10. Jesus is quoted as saying, and it's a quote from the Old Testament, but it's talking about Jesus there in Hebrews 10. He came into the world and he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And that body was a body for him to do the will of God in, for him to obey God to absolute perfection in a human body as a man. That's what God has always wanted for someone to keep his law in a human body. And that's what Jesus came to give him. Romans 5 and verse 19 says that we are saved by Christ's obedience. And it is his obedience to the law of God that saves us because we did not keep the law of God because we have broken all of God's laws. Jesus came and obeyed God to complete 
perfection. He never made a mistake. He never said anything he shouldn't have said. He never did anything he shouldn't have done. And again, we don't understand God's holiness, and we don't understand how Jesus could be a perfectly righteous and holy and sinless man. But he was. He comes into the world. First Peter chapter 2 tells us that he did no sin, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. Absolutely nothing wrong the entire time that he lived here. But that's something that you trust in. That's something that you believe. You believe in his perfect doing, his perfect life what he did in your stead and on your behalf. And when you do that, then your faith becomes credited as righteousness. And the things that he accomplished become yours as far as the way God views things. And that, of course, comes from the third thing, which is his perfect dying. So his perfect demands, his perfect doing, his perfect dying, Jesus Christ dying as a sacrifice, taking that body that he had lived perfectly in and laying it down as a sacrifice for the rest of us, those of us who have not lived perfectly. By one offering, Hebrews chapter 10 says, he has perfected forever those who are being made holy. We are the ones who have been made perfect, those who trust in Christ. In God's eyes, we are now absolutely perfect. Don't understand his holiness. Don't understand how Jesus fully obeyed God in a human body. And we don't understand the sacrificial death of Jesus, how he has perfected us forever through his death. But we know that this man offered one sacrifice for sins forever and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's in Hebrews chapter 10. And he compares that to the old priests, the Old Testament priests, uh, who continually stood offering sacrifices. They could never sit down, if you will, the way Jesus could because their work was never finished, because their work could never really actually take away sins. But this man, Jesus, he offered only one sacrifice. It only had to be done one time. And then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the work is finished. Now, what do you do to something that is finished? You admire it, you point to it, you respect it, you trust in it. You cannot supplement something that's finished. You cannot add to something that's finished. You can only rely on it and trust in it. And that's what it means to trust in Jesus for salvation, to realize we have not met God's demands, but Jesus did. And we trust in him. We receive the benefits, if you will, of what he has done. Everything that Jesus did while he was on this earth, he did for us. He did for others. He did not come into this world for himself. He did not obey the law of God for himself. He did it for us. And we need to trust entirely in what Jesus did and tell others about what Jesus did. And if you keep those three things in mind, what God requires, what Jesus did in his obedience while he lived in a human body here on earth and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins, then you will understand what it means to trust in Jesus. And don't forget that he not only died, but he was raised from the dead. And God announced to the world that he had accepted payment for our sins by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember, when you are thinking about Jesus, it is a matter of trusting in Jesus. And the thing that makes you trust in Jesus is to realize what I have not done and then realize what he has done in my stead and in my place and on my behalf. And it's a very simple way to look at it, and it should be, because it is a simple story of God's love shown to us in Christ. Thank you so much for viewing our podcast. We appreciate that very much, and we look forward to being with you next time on the Assembly Podcast with Dwayne Dunaway.